Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded and a time for those willing to question what they think they know or what they may believe, those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, my partner Ravinder is here in the studio with me, looking as pretty as ever. So, Ravinder, say hello to everyone. Share your special insight for the day, and please tell everyone how they can learn more about our show. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so glad that you can join us. It's uh, another glorious day. Um, yeah, to learn more about the the sh- show, you can you know access all of the archives from about the last 13 years if you just go to provocativeenlightenment.com. Um, and then if you, you can also friend us on Facebook, uh, any important information that is shared on the air, I will post that, um, on our Facebook page. So simply do a search for Provocative Enlightenment Radio. All right. In today's spotlight, I would like to discuss intimidation. Webster defines intimidation this way. To compel or deter by or as if by threats. To frighten. Now, I think we all know what intimidation is and recognize it when we see it. During our last two shows, though, we have discussed threats, some made by young people against their parents, such as, I will disown you, mother, if you vote that way. In other words, vote the way I want you to vote, or you'll lose your son. I suppose there are many who can justify this action because they are convinced that the vote is for or against evil. But think about that for a moment. Elections come and go. In the history of our country, we have had 59 presidential elections, and about 9% of those elected did not win the popular vote. Obviously, there have been many divisions among the voters over time, but presidents come and go. Indeed, a fair estimate is that in a single lifetime, there will be the opportunity for 20 or more possible presidents to take the office. That said, how many mothers will you have in your lifetime? Do you really want to intimidate your mother this way? Is that the intelligent, caring way to persuade It seems unimaginable to some, myself included, that you would call out someone in a public place, such as a restaurant, for holding a different political view than your own, calling a person evil names in front of his wife and children, attempting to embarrass and humiliate them in public. Well, any idiot can recognize this as pure intimidation. It is designed to demonstrate moderate self-control, or elite intellectualism? I ask you again, is it designed to demonstrate moderate self-control or elite intellectualism? I think not. It's schoolyard bullying, pure and simple. Then there are those social media gurus who teach peace, balance, and harmony, posting every day about such things as the beauty and healing power in unconditional love. Witness their next post. Anyone voting for XYZ candidates should know that I will unfriend you immediately. Wow, what a marvelous example of not walking your talk. I have spoken to several professionals on this show who are afraid to say what they think or believe because they'll lose out on a promotion, tenor, or perhaps even lose their job. When did our social order devolve to attempts at winning our way through intimidation? Further, often this intimidation is carried out in groups of a half a dozen or more. Groups. I think of them as gangs. 
That's what we all would have called them back in grade school. A gang of folks insisting on their own way and not through tolerant, peaceful means. My question to all, regardless of the club or identity to which you pledge your loyalty, is simple. When did intimidation become an acceptable means of communication? Are we no longer seeking to communicate? Is getting our own way more important than dignity and honor? For there is no dignity or honor in the examples I have offered. And here is the real danger. When we cease to communicate with one another, we begin sliding the slope of the strongest prevail. We become more beast-like, law of the jungle. And when that happens, everything we want to disagree over regarding matters of democracy collapse. For we have demolished the democratic rights we supposedly are fighting to preserve. Those are my thoughts. As always, I welcome yours. What do you have to say about that, Ravinder? I think it's a really, really important conversation. You're totally correct about intimidation. And it's not only what's going on right now uh, with politics. This has been building up slowly for a number of years now. You know, I still go back to the Paula Dean story. Um, because of something she said some years ago, the cancel culture shut her down. Is that right? Is there room for people to change and to improve? I was talking to someone just the other day and they were going on about something XYZ had said back in the 70s. And it's like, does it really apply? The world is such a different place today. Just think back the last 20 years. We've all grown. We have all grown. I think it is time for forgiveness. Um, the tactics of bullying and intimidation have increased, and that that's increased with the Internet. You know, a great deal of that comes with anonymity. You know, uh, people can say a whole lot more. But there's also, I think, a feeling of distance. When you're on your keyboard, you're a whole lot more likely to say something harsh about someone else. No, I think... It hasn't ever been more important to listen, listen to other people. You know, we are all Americans. Um, yeah, presidents come and go. It, it, it's a, it's a really difficult time. I think we are, we're all on the same side and it's just a small group who is intimidating by being so loud and shutting down conversation. And then because you, you have the concern that you don't want to say something that antagonizes the group or you get comfort in being part of the group. There are lots of dangers involved in what is going on right now and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to stop and to think and to listen. I agree. Civility, I believe, is uh, has got to be the word of the day. We're going to talk about how easy it is to become addicted to those behaviors today by way of neurochemicals with our special guest. All right, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Our last show featured Robert Sachs, and we discussed his work and book, The Path of Civility, a timely book, a good read. Tom wrote, Nice to know there was a time when people were civil, but I'm not hopeful that's in our future. Elizabeth wrote, thanks for the show with Robert. I like what he had to say. Nathan said, so Dr. Taylor, I was surprised to hear you agree with Mr. Sachs. Do you consider yourself an activist too? Well, Nathan, I suppose all of us are activists if we're willing to stand up for what we believe and willing to honestly listen, listen, and discuss issues with those who hold opposing opinions. The operative word there, Nathan, is listen. Moving on, Jeannie wrote, Your inner talk work is very wonderful. I have used it for years because it does so much good. And Angelica wrote, all I can say is that your work is terrific and beneficial to me and my clients. 
All right, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but please keep your comments coming. We do sincerely appreciate your feedback. You can opine by sending me an email at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at eldontaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor. And listen, if you send me a letter, an email, be sure you put provocative enlightenment in the subject line. I get a lot of emails and, you know... It's a very time-consuming thing to look at a couple or three hundred of them three or four times a day. Without that in the subject line, I can easily go over it, and I don't mean to. So once again, Eldon at EldonTaylor.com. Put provocative enlightenment in the subject line. Now to today's show, How I Escape Political Correctness, and you can too with Professor Lettera Loretta Bruning. Now, Professor Bruning has been with us before. Indeed, she is one of my personal favorites. But for those of you unfamiliar with her, let me tell you a little about today's guest. Loretta Bruning, Ph.D., is founder of the Inner Mammal Institute and author of Habits of a Happy Brain, Retrain Your Brain to Boost Your Serotonin, Dopamine, Oxytocin, and Endorphin Levels. She's Professor Emerita of management at California State University, East Bay. Her many books and digital resources are designed to help people find their power to manage their brain chemicals. And I highly recommend her work. All right, on that, let's get her in here. Welcome back to Provocative Enlightenment, Professor Loretta Bruning. Hi, Elton. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's indeed my pleasure. You know, I love you. I love what you write. I love the work you do. And I was especially taken by your new one. So uh, let's begin with where you know. Uh, we like to know three things on our, our show. Um, what is the message? Who is the messenger? And, of course, how do we use it? To that end, Professor, please share with us what you're passionate about today and why. Well, I love that introduction you gave first, I have to say, and I'm passionate about people taking responsibility for their own brain chemistry instead of projecting it onto others, because that's, I think, at the core of this political divisiveness, which is blaming your unhappiness on some political enemy that you've defined instead of seeing how you create it yourself. So you heard the spotlight. Um, Yeah. What would you add? What have I got wrong? Oh, it was perfect. Thank you. (laughs) Um, What would I add? Um, Her behavior is a real physical, biological thing that we've inherited in our deeper limbic system. And it's always been there. And what feels like new behaviors today are each generation finds new ways to express these natural impulses. And of course, we're here to manage these impulses rather than just to act on them in the basest way. And um, how to manage them, uh, each generation has its own strategies and the current strategy is unfortunate and I take objection to it the way you do. Yes, I do too, obviously. Listen, Professor. I get puzzled, and so mm, I look at the D.C. riots that went on last night, yesterday, I should say, Mm -hmm. uh, and the violence. And I think, you know, I mean, I was a criminalist for years, and so, and I counseled in the the prison system. Um, And I I talked to a lot of these people, and I think, okay, look, have you got... You got this uh, fellow off to the side that was just kicking this man that was down that we see in the video. That's just one of many videos. And you said to him, you know, how would you like to manage your brain chemicals? What do you (laughs) think this guy is going to say to you? So, (laughs) Professor, how do you get to these people? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I wish there were a fast, easy solution. So the link here is that. Our brain chemicals are wired by past experience. Experience builds real physical connections in your neurons. So the person who's acting out in that way has learned from past experience to expect to feel good in that particular way. 
And how do they learn that? Well, there's a whole support group, a whole herd that says, this is the way to feel your power by um, vilifying people who don't share your opinion. And how do they arrive at this opinion? Again, they expect a good feeling when they reproduce the opinions of their herd, of their herd leaders. And it's pretty hard to build new wiring, but that's really the solution, you know? Yeah, unfortunately, I do. And I, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's slow. <laughs> the things I could suggest, I would never do so on the air. So here, mm. let's start with the beginning. In your book, How I Escaped Political Correctness, you tell a story of how you had to decide in front of 150 students whether to tell the truth or relay the approved story. Now, I've talked to a number of professors willing to admit that from a variety of institutions, uh, some of them the most prestigious, that they check their tongue because it could mean their tenor um, or, you know, being rejected by the rest of the group, uh, etc. So you had to face that pressure yourself. Please share this story with us. Flesh out the details. Tell us what in your neurochemical wiring gave rise to the tenacity necessary to stand up and call it the way it was. Sure. Um, first, I should say that um, before that moment, I had been sort of going along with the herd. And when we go along with the herd, our animal brain releases good feelings. And so then our human verbal brain justifies it with some intellectual reason. We never tell ourselves, I'm just going along with the herd, but we come up with some moral superiority that makes us sound intellectually justified. So of course I was good at doing that. And the split second that I talk about at the introduction to the book is when I realized I was literally going to lie. So the incident was um, I was teaching about quality control, which I think is part of the problem that is a lot of today's anxiety. So an uh, older generation remembers when, like it was a joke, but like our cars broke down a lot. And then new quality control methods were instituted. And now our cars never break down and nobody appreciates this. Everybody just finds new things to criticize. But quality control methods were one way of criticizing by finding things that go wrong. So I was teaching about that. And college professors have this shared paradigm that uh, involves everything American is bad and everything from other countries is good. And I subscribe to that. Um, as uh, as a person who I wanted to be a good person, I wanted to be a good student, uh, I wanted to be a member in good standing of my community, and so subconsciously I justified it intellectually. So I'm teaching that this is a Japanese thing, these quality control techniques. So a student raises his hand and says, well, didn't they get that from us, the Japanese? And I knew, in fact, that that was true. But that triggered my fear that if I said, yes, it's true, then that made America look better and Japan look worse. And that violates the paradigm of political correctness that I had learned. And so then I had two competing paradigms, like not wanting to get kicked out of the herd, but not wanting to say an outright lie. And so my, it was like an alarm bell, like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And, and that's the first time that I was consciously aware of what I had been doing all along, which is sort of spinning the facts to make them fit the PC paradigm. Yeah. All right. What, what happened as a result of that? Did you get any backlash? Um, <laughs> uh well, first, you know, cognitive dissonance, if anyone has studied this, is that you find some way to uh, lower the value of the person. So, like, I would have found something flawed with my student, like, oh, those people who think America's good, something is wrong with them. That's how I had been indoctrinated in my education. Right. Um, but I didn't get much backlash because 
I think I sort of mumbled and did give a very clear answer. And I sort of froze. And it was that flooding of awareness uh, that sort of um, caught my tongue. So you ask, how was I able then to, to, um, to do something different rather than just follow the herd? So I want to say this in a very honest way because we're all mammals. So I could give you some great speech about integrity and how I have such great integrity. But, you know, that's what we all do. We all find a way to make ourselves sound morally superior. But what's the honest truth from the animal level of my brain is that I was never a herd person, a herd follower, because I grew up in a very outcast kind of way. I never had a herd when I was growing up, so I never really learned to trust the herd. And so on the one hand, I feared being kicked out of the herd and losing my job and being shunned. But on the other hand, by the way, I couldn't lose my job because I had tenure, but I feared being socially shunned. But on the other hand, I also feared being with the herd because I had sort of been indoctrinated that the herd was going to jump over a cliff like lemmings. And so I had been wired with a sort of a lose-lose that being with the herd is bad, but being without the herd is bad. I got you. So now you take the next step. You've confronted this. You're aware of it. Obviously, you've said to yourself, that's it. I'm not going to participate in a lie any longer. And you write a book, How I Escape Political Correctness, and you can too. And the book caused a fair amount of stir among many. Indeed, one reviewer had this to say, and I'll quote, I respect the author for her knowledge of the mammalian brain and the chemicals therein. However, after reading this book three times, I have come to the conclusion she has simply replaced the hyper-liberalism of her youth and training with her hyper-conservatism, replete with customary loathing of the CNN, NBC, PBS, MSM, i.e. the liberal media. To that, close quote, to that, Professor, what do you say? <laughs> Well, first, I have to say that um, there was like a good 20 years, um, I have to stop and do the math, uh, more than 20 years between the moment that I had that insight and the moment, well, first, there was 10 years between the moment I had that insight and the moment that I decided that my um, authenticity of my own thoughts had more value than the approval of the herd, that I was willing to take some risks. And then another 10 years or more went by between when I uh, reclaimed my authenticity internally and when I spoke out publicly. So that's the first half. Now, the second half is that you, you, you uh, remind me of that um, comment. So I do not read the comments, especially would not read the negative comments. Uh, so when I have positive feedback from someone like you, I'm very grateful. I focus on that and I create my inner world with that. I do not focus on the negative comments. Now, some people may say that that's delusional or false. And in fact, with my verbal brain here, I can argue with that comment that you read and I can come up with fancy arguments to, to uh, undermine it. But the reality is that if I allowed myself to focus on those criticisms, then it would weaken me and it would wear on me and I wouldn't have the courage to go through my life. So instead, I've trained my brain to focus on the positive, And that's the subject of a different book of mine. And the way I did that is I literally noticed one day that when I give a talk, that my eyes were focused on a person in the audience who was grimacing. And I thought, wow, what a crazy choice that somehow I'm attracted to that person who's grimacing and that's creating a negative feedback loop and I have the power to just focus on something else. That's a wonderful, wonderful story. We have a break, Professor. When we come back, I'm gonna ask you, what's wrong with CNN, NBC, MSN? <laughs> Okay, we're okay. speaking with Professor Loretta Bruning about her work and book, books. I'll pluralize that because 
Habits of a Happy Brain happens to be my favorite. It's a wonderful book. We we recommend it to everybody. It is all about what you just heard the professor say. You you have chosen to train your mind to be rewarded with certain neurochemicals as a, as opposed to allowing those neurochemicals to respond to stimuli that that then in turn negatively impact not just your mindset, but your body and your well, your health as well. And we, we may get into that a little later in the show. Listen, you can learn more about our guest and her books by visiting InnerMammalInstitute.org. One word, InnerMammalInstitute.org. All right, we'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used InnerTalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD, and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your Inner Talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Professor Loretta Bruning about her work and books, in particularly how I escape political correctness and how you can too. You can learn more about our guest and her books by visiting InnerMammalInstitute.org. Okay, every week we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some real meaning to them. Music psychology, as you know by now, is an avocation of mine, and it's a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. So, Professor, don't wait too long as the music you chose. Please tell us, why is this music important to you? And more importantly, how does it inform us about who you are? Sure. Um, The words that come before that is, if you think time will change your ways, don't wait too long. So the idea is that we're wired, our brains are wired from early experience, and so we don't change over time. And it's sort of eerie, like even with the pandemic, I say that everybody is reverting to who they already were. (laughs) And everybody's now blaming the pandemic for the behaviors that they just already did. Um, so it's hard to build new neural pathways. We don't change easily. It takes a long time. And so you can't just wait for it to happen by accident. If you want to have new behaviors, you have to start building the pathways one step at a time. Oh, how does that say who I am? Um, well, I was like everybody else, you know, I was wired by, early experience and I grew up around a lot of distress so I was creating a lot of unnecessary distress in my life and did a lot of research and study and gradually learned to rewire myself all right Uh, we used I used to train racehorses and we used to say about the horses put them in a push of scenario and they'll revert to their earliest instinct however they were handled when they were very young. I think you're right about what we see with this COVID. And we talk about spousal abuse and we talk about child abuse, we talk about depression and all these other things. But what we really are seeing is just a reverting 
to who that person was when they weren't so distracted with the world around them of glitter and events and whatnot. Yes. What have, what have I got wrong? Oh, yes, absolutely. And I will fess up that I my, I have a sort of a workaholic impulse. And I was like, well, you know what? This gives me permission to be a workaholic. And I was like, great, I'm enjoying it. But I see other people are sort of, they just want to eat. And they say, well, this gives me permission to just eat. So I see how people use it as permission to do whatever they want. Amen. All right, you stayed in your book. Political correctness advocates, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I promised I was going to ask you first. Yes. CNN, NBC, MSN, what, what's, what's the problem with liberal media? So here's the problem. Mammals bond around common enemies. So any group of mammals, let's take baboons, they stick together when there is a predator, but when there's no predator, they disperse because it's easier to find food that way. So the more predators, the more mammals stick together, and it sort of reduces tension in a group when you focus on an external enemy. When you're not focused on an internal enemy, then there's conflict within the group. So the media keep you focused on an in, on an external enemy. So when you when you listen to the mainstream media outlets, every single problem is blamed on conservatives. So that's the common enemy. So anyone who's defined as a member of the left-wing coalition, they can do no wrong. They're the good guys. They never do anything wrong and everything bad that happens to them is caused by <clears throat> excuse me, is caused by someone who's not in their coalition. And this is feels good in the short run. It stimulates oxytocin, which is the trust chemical that we enjoy when we have social support. And it relieves stress. It relieves the threat chemical because your mammal brain fears being isolated, being not in the herd. Uh, so it feels good in the short run, but it's really bad for us in the long run. And it's not democracy, because democracy is the idea that it's okay to have different perspectives. And humans have worked for, for generations, for millennia, to develop democracy. And now the idea is being promoted by college professors, I'm sad to say, that like my idea is right, and my coalition, my tribe, my herd is right, and then anyone who's not in my group is the enemy, and anything I do to hurt that enemy is justified, which is really unhealthy and, again, anti-democratic. I agree with all of that. But the uh, the counter-argument, the devil's advocate, may well step up and say, how is Fox any different? It blames everything on the left. Well, Fox is, now, is not doing that anymore. Fox has started um, mostly vilifying the right. Um, but any 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 media outlet that blames everything on the left, I disagree with them too, and I don't listen to them. I don't give them access to my brain. So this whole idea of unifying around common enemies, I don't like it. And and frankly, it's hard to socialize without it. So if you're not in one group with one kind of common enemy, you're in another group with another common enemy. So it's really hard to be like considered a quote unquote a team player or a good person unless you support other people's uh, vilifying enemy paradigm. And so I'm I, I'm not a good team player. <laughs> and I, I get that. I, I, I actually relate to it. You state in your book, political correctness advocates doing what feels good and blaming others when things don't work out. This is obviously not good for you, you continue, or for the greater good. But it's easy to sell, so it's good for the people who sell it. What What is it uh, about the people that sell it? I mean, how would we reach to them in order to change this? And how is it good for them? Um, well, first, uh, again, we want to be careful not to vilify them, because then we'd be doing the same thing. So I try to say that the universal um, mammal brain in all of us, it seeks power, although it's become politically incorrect to say that. 
So when it seeks power, it seeks the one-up position. I explain this in my new book, Status Games, which will be out next year. And when we seek the one-up position, it stimulates our serotonin and it feels good. So um, if you wanted to um, have a one-up position, by recruiting followers, by recruiting people who believe in your thought framework, or just to get promoted in whatever communication industry you may work in, or whatever job you're in. So you try to um, sell, uh, the more followers you have, the more social importance you have. And how do you get followers? Do you get it by giving them the truth or by making them feel good? And I think, you know, we know the answer. Yes, no kidding. All right, listen, you talk about PC sport. And if I understand you correctly, that's basically shaming what you refer to as deviance into profuse apologies. Tell us what this sport is about. Uh, well, it has since I wrote the book, it has gotten the name the cancel culture. So now it's very simple. Everybody knows exactly what I mean. Um, many people who do this, they may say that they're anti-bullying, but it's, it's, it's exactly what bullying is. And you said that in the introduction. So the idea is that um, animals are very good at weighing their power and strength against other animals. And they never engage in conflict that they know they're going to lose. You've all seen like two moose with antlers and Moose only fight when their antlers are the same size. So how, what can I do if I perceive myself to have smaller antlers is that I find another guy to build an alliance with me. And now the two of us are stronger than you. But then you go and look for someone else to, to fight back against me. And so everyone's sort of trying to recruit allies to have a position of strength. And if you don't join one coalition or another, then you risk being isolated. And your mammal brain perceives that as a threat, like I'm going to be eaten by a predator because I don't have one group or another to protect me. Gotcha. Okay, Professor, you're out speaking. Uh, you're writing books. Uh, you're involved with... Uh, larger groups of people on a regular basis, whether virtually or otherwise. Uh, where do you get your news? Because it would seem to me you'd have to remain informed, even though you may guard where that information comes from and the impact it has on you. Well, actually, no. <laughs> so I avoid the news as much as possible. I used to joke that my, my only source of information was the the little box when you know when you have a newspaper in, in in one of those boxes and you walk down the street and you see through that little box and now those hardly exist anymore so i know that many people would say well you must be ignorant if you're not following the news but in my opinion the news is designed to make you angry to get you upset about threats to your coalition and so i would be upset all the time if I took one source of news or the other. So how can I get, you know, the truth? It's, we can't know the truth, you know? And so what do I need that's actionable that I need for my own life? So, you know what? I'm, uh, anything that's that important will, you know, it'll, it'll eventually, I'll find out from word of mouth, from something or other, most of it blows over. So the real risk is that other people will think I'm stupid because they haven't heard like, oh, have you heard the latest? I'm like, fine. You want to think I'm stupid because I haven't heard the latest? Fine. Go for it. All right. Listen, we've talked a lot about the kind of stimulation that produces negative chemicals. We haven't actually talked about how those negative chemicals impact us. But before we get to that, what stimulates our happy chemicals? Good. Um, so our happy chemicals are not designed to be on all the time as much as we wish that were true. When you see how they work in animals, you see that they're only released in short spurts at specific moments when the animal has an opportunity to promote its survival. 
and, and the animal brain to find survival in a quirky way, which is basically what's called reproductive success by biologists. And there are four different happy chemicals that I talk about, as you mentioned, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphin. And each of them rewards us with a different good feeling when we meet a different survival need. And we want all of them. So whenever we got it going on with one or two of them, then instead of being happy about that, we focus on the one we don't have and try to get that. Give, give me an idea now. You, you practice what you preach. So you get up in the morning. And what do you do to get them all the neurochemicals, the good, happy neurochemicals? Come on. What, what do you do? Sure. Okay. So this is going to be very different from what people hear in other places. And, and I know what people have heard. So, so first, dopamine is stimulated by progress toward a goal. We inherited it from ancestors that had to look constantly for food. And dopamine got you excited when you found food or water or firewood. And because our needs are already met, then we need some other kind of goal to step toward. So my first thing in the morning is I give myself time, basically the first three hours or more, to only focus on difficult, big projects that I feel like I'm progressing towards, towards some goal that's meaningful to me, rather than fritting it away on little, you know, little administrative things. So that's my dopamine. And um, I talk about, like, you can't always be moving toward a big goal because there are obstacles. So we need to have short-run goals to uh, get that fun, that joy of meeting a need. So I save some fun little goals for the evening when I'm exhausted. So like, for example, I get a nice email from Eldon Taylor and like re reading it and replying to that is like fun, but also advances me toward a goal. So I would save that for the night when I'm exhausted. Now, the other ones, serotonin is actually from pride, from confidence, from feeling in the one-up position. And uh, it's, it's very hard to sustain that. So the main thing is when I feel that I'm getting tired, feeling hurt, um, feeling bad about something, is to catch myself and see how I'm putting myself down and then giving myself free time to relax because I know that when I'm exhausted that I'm more likely to go into old loops about feeling my own weakness and make it harder to feel my own strength. So giving myself some uh, reward time rather than feeling like I've never done enough and I always have to do more uh, or uh, feeling like victimized. Um, but rather seeing that things that happened to me, how did I create them and feeling my own power. You could do that just like in one minute or 10 minutes just by giving yourself enough rest breaks. And then oxytocin is social support. So how can I feel social support? There are different ways to do it. One is um, to, to be with a herd all the time. But the more modern way is what's called weak links. And people can re, uh, Google this. There's some research on what's called weak links. So uh, like I, um, how can I take time out in the afternoon to strengthen my link with this one and then strengthen my link with that one instead of worrying about whether I have social support is to proactively say, okay, I'm going to spend a few minutes every day. One day I'll invest in this person. One day I'll invest in that person. I love it. I love it. Um, I make it a habit, and I tell everybody that I've ever worked with, uh, you know, when you first wake up in the morning, put a big smile on your face, even if you have to force it. Say thank you, thank you, thank you, and I don't care what you're saying thank you to. Uh, because that'll set a whole trend. Is that good advice? Um, yes, but if if people don't feel it, um, so I, I wrote about this. I have another book called The Science of Positivity, Stop mm -hmm. Negative Thought Patterns by Changing Your Brain Chemistry. So what you said is great, but I think it's half of it. So the other half, like 
so often when I wake up in the morning before I'm really conscious, I realize like to my shock that I'm thinking about something bad. And it's like the worst thing that happened yesterday is on my mind the instant I wake up before like this is my child. Well, we're all reproducing our childhood. So what happened when I was a child, I would wake up every morning to the sound of my mother screaming. And so my first thought in the morning was, what did I do to upset her? What can I do to avoid upsetting her? Like taking inventory, why is she mad at me? What did I do wrong? What can I do to protect myself? So that's my automatic. So your listeners can think about what's their automatic. It's like the worst thing that ever happened to you in your whole life that's the biggest pathway in your brain. And as you boot up your brain when you wake up in the morning, that's where you go. And then you look for new situations today that fit that old horrible pattern. And I had to say, wow, I'm doing it. I can't believe I'm doing it. And then I was like, oh, that gives, that gives me the power to let go of it because I realized I did it myself. It's not that so-and-so was really mad at me, but I created the thought that they're mad at me. I like that. I like that. Why has it become taboo to acknowledge that mammals are competitive? Thank you. Um, you know, I was just writing, and you, you're on my, my list, so you may have read, like, even plants are competitive. <laughs> um, so why is it taboo? So... Um, People who like to watch animal documentaries, if you have just done that recently, you see that animals are cooperative and loving and altruistic because that has become the politically correct way to represent animals. But before that, there was a whole century of research full of the truth, which is that anybody who is around animals has observed and you've worked with horses so you know that um, animals compete for frankly for mating opportunity they compete for food they compete for water and they also cooperate but they only cooperate when it helps them compete and to get more food and water and mating opportunity and all of my books explain this um, I had a whole book on it called I mammal um, how um, what's the subtitle, um, How to Make Peace with the Animal Urge for Social Power. And I have a new book about it coming out next year called Status Games, Why We Play and How to Stop. And David Attenborough, my hero, is 95 years old. And so he started making nature videos about competitive animals because he studied this in the 50s when the truth was there. And then he slowly uh, academics sort of now they shun you. Let's first say that they applaud you if you find examples of animals displaying progressive behavior. But animals don't act according to the progressive prescription most of the time. So they're really cherry picking the science to, to say it in a nutshell. Right. I have one last question, Professor, and we've only got about a minute. It's my understanding that the way the neurochemicals work, you can actually become addicted to failure. Flesh that out uh, for us, please. Okay, so um, addiction is just a medicalized word. The reality is that neurons connect whenever your happy chemicals flow, whenever your unhappy chemicals flow. So when you fail, if you get a reward such as social support or social status by being special or dopamine by saying, well, I got that out of the way now that I've failed. So anytime you get a reward, neurons connect and then you expect a reward by repeating that behavior. All right. I love your work. I've got a dozen more questions here. We're going to have to bring you back, especially when you get your new books out. In 30 seconds or so, please tell our listening audience where they can get your materials, learn more about you, read your blog, learn more about the Mammal Institute, etc. Great. Thanks. So innermammalinstitute.org, innermammalinstitute.org. And I have videos if you want to hear this message 
in a really short and fun way that you can share with your family. Click on videos. And um, I have a podcast and every different format of information, plus all my books. And I love your work. I highly recommend it. I sincerely want to thank you for doing what you do and for sharing it with us, Professor Bruni. We wish you the best in your every endeavor to come. All right. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show. And we'll join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends. Let's have them join us as well. Okay, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.